We have an exciting new study to talk about, and this is the longest duration intermittent fasting study published to date. This was a 12-month clinical study to look at the differences between a 16-hour daily fast versus a 12-hour daily fast. Now, you might be thinking, are those additional four hours of fasting? How could they really move the needle? How could they affect visceral adipose tissue? How could they affect cardiometabolic risk factors like insulin, like HDL, like triglycerides, or leptin and adiponectin? All things that this study looked at. In addition, they also looked at markers of chronic inflammation. Over the last 12 months, you know, 24 months, we've talked a lot about baseline levels of chronic inflammation and how those baseline levels of chronic inflammation can predispose you to poor outcomes when it comes to getting infected with a virus. So this is a really important study if you want to stay safe, but also if we're talking about long-term health, because what was unique about this study is the study subjects, well, there's a few things that are unique. Number one, the study subjects are physically active. They had all been physically active and regularly resistance training for up to five years prior to the start of this experiment. So that's pretty interesting. So we're working with a healthy subset who's already kind of living the life that we're all trying to espouse and promote on this channel and this podcast, right? But the second thing is the difference here was just a four-hour feeding window difference, which I think is pretty accessible and achievable. It's one thing to tell a sedentary overweight person, hey, just start exercising and then start fasting and then start fasting 16 hours. And those are a lot of changes. But again, we're just manipulating one variable here. And that was four hours. Now, I'm going to unpack all the details, but here's hints at what is coming. That four hours is significant. And the cost of that, the downsides, there's not much. There was a small reduction in arm size. I mean, there were still all study subjects in both study arms, whether it's they were fasting for 16 hours a day or 12 hours a day, improved their strength. In fact, the time-restricted feeding group had better relative strength improvements compared to the normal diet group. But there was a small difference in muscle uh, circumference and size in the arms and the legs. But to me, it's like I would trade off a little slightly smaller arms and legs for all of the metabolic health improvements and reductions in chronic inflammatory signaling factors that we're going to unpack in this study. It's really, really fascinating. The title of the paper here, 12 months of time-restricted eating and resistance training improve inflammatory markers and cardiometabolic risk factors. The journal here is uh, Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. So some of the authors, you might remember a few of these characters and uh, not characters, but really cool scientists and investigators here, Grant Tinsley and Antonio Powali. So we've shared a lot of their studies and reviews over the last several years. Um, they've been conducting various time-restricted feeding analysis and research and experiments. And I think this is really, really, really fascinating stuff. And I want to give a shout out to them and thank Antonio Powali over in Italy for sending this to me in this uh, accepted uh, PDF. So we're going to dive into that and talk about the differences. But first, friends, I want to welcome you back. It's Mike Mutzel. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for hitting that like button. And thank you for leaving something nice in the comments below. You know that comments help the algorithm. They help get this video into the eyes of people who may also benefit, who are searching out health-related content just like you. So that comment helps. If you're in iTunes, you can share this direct link as well. Now, a few things that we're going to talk about. You might be wondering... Should I start intermittent fasting? Is intermittent fasting right for me? So I want to introduce you to some testing, at-home testing solutions, and also dietary supplements that can accelerate your fast. We're going to talk about berberine. We're also going to talk about looking at your hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of your average glucose. So the folks over at biocoach.io for Cyber Week and Black Friday, they have a great promotion going on where if you buy one at-home hemoglobin A1C test, you get the second one 40% off. Now, why is that significant? Because your friends, your family, your spouse, if you're trying to convince them to embark on the same healthy living, healthy lifestyle endeavors, compressing feeding window, eating less carbs, exercising more, you might need to get a little bit of a buy-in. And you can get that buy-in by, guess what, convincing them that they might need to make improvements. Because once people see that their hemoglobin A1C is over 6 or 6.6 .6 or 6.7, or you know, it's starting to increase and they're on that path, towards prediabetes or diabetes, they are more motivated to make changes. So this is an affordable way to help foster and accelerate 
those healthy lifestyle changes. So you can use the coupon code HIH10 over at biocoach.io for the at-home hemoglobin A1C test. Now, also what we're going to talk about, friends, is using berberine to kickstart your fast. A lot of you have considered this, have asked about this. When is the best time to dose berberine? So one of the things that I highly recommend and work with my clients, we talk about it in the Bloodwork Masterclass, is kickstarting your fast with berberine hydrochloride. So there's a great solution over at Myoscience that pairs berberine hydrochloride with associated accessory nutrients like alpha lipoic acid and biotin. This can be a great way to start your evening fast or your morning fast, depending upon your feeding window. The only time you really don't want to take berberine is right before you work out. So if you are fasting in the morning and you have a feeding window like me, you break your fast usually at around 11 or noon, you can take berberine in the morning. You can also take it after or around your last meal to kickstart your evening fast. So you can use the coupon code podcast over at myoscience.com. That's podcast at M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. So let's get into the nitty gritty and talk specifically about how long-term daily fasting impacts muscle mass, strength, a lot of you care about that, fat metabolism, and cardiometabolic health. So the researchers randomized subjects with five or more years of consistent weightlifting experience into two different feeding groups for the duration of the 12-month study. A time-restricted feeding group was instructed to eat three meals at daily you know, meals between 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. And the normal diet, which we'll refer to henceforth as normal diet, was instructed to eat three meals daily at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 8 p.m. In essence, the study was designed to test the long-term effect of a 16-hour fast versus a 12-hour fast. Now, throughout the duration of the 12-month study, dietitians worked with study subjects to ensure meals contained sufficient energy so there were some initial metabolic assessments to make sure that the amount of calories were appropriate so that these individuals would not get into a calorie deficit and lose strength. And so that we're really comparing apples to apples and seeing how is the outcome differences, uh, you know, how is the metabolic differences between an additional four hours of fasting, improving strength, fat loss, and all of that. The dietitians would also uh, they're trying to make sure that there was adherence to the study protocols. Now, it's worth mentioning that the calorie distribution of the course of the study was a little bit different in the time-restricted feeding arm versus the normal diet arm. So in the TRF arm, 40% of the energy was in their breakfast at 1 p.m. About 25% of their daily calories was consumed at their lunchtime, which was around four. And then 35% of their calories was consumed at dinner. So slightly different uh, in the, the normal diet arm, but similar in the sense that the bulk of the calories was actually consumed around the middle part of the day, which is incidentally from a circadian rhythm standpoint when the gut is most active. So remember their feeding window in the normal diet was 8, 1, and 8 p.m. So they had 25% of their energy daily intake in the morning at, for breakfast. 40% of that was at lunchtime and 35% of that was at dinner at 8 p.m. As we mentioned earlier, weight training was part of the study, but it wasn't supervised over the course of the study. But subjects were instructed to lift weights between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., and study subjects in both arms consumed a 20 gram whey protein shake after the afternoon training session. So the scientists found that study subjects in the TRF group actually had a spontaneous reduction in their daily calorie intake by about 6.1%, which was associated with a small reduction in the resting metabolic rate. And this was also linked with a 3.36% reduction in overall body weight and an 18.8% .8 reduction in visceral fat. Now, in contrast, the study subjects in the normal feeding group actually gained 3.37% body mass. So these are not massive swings in body fat and body composition and visceral fat. And it's worth noting that the normal diet group actually didn't lose any visceral adipose tissue. Now, let's talk about strength and muscle size because this is really important. Remember, all the study subjects as part of the inclusion criteria had been resistance training for at least five years prior to the start of the study. So these are people that are very familiar with lifting weights. They continue to lift weights throughout the study, a 12-month study. And they looked at, uh, to objectively measure strength, muscle loss, and things like that, they looked at one rep max on bench press and leg press. So pretty easy way to repeat and look at changes above baseline. And there wasn't a lot of differences in terms of strength, loss, or gain in I mean, both groups actually gained strength, okay, over the course of the 12 month uh, period because they were training, they were eating right, they were doing that. So they all gained strength, but there wasn't statistically significant differences between the two, two different groups. But what was different is the muscle circumference. So the CSA is the muscle cross sectional area. And this is a way to objectively measure muscle gain or muscle loss. Now, here's where things get interesting because, of course, this actually favored the normal diet group over the course of the study. So what, what was noted here 
is there were significant differences in the circumference of muscle uh, between the two different groups. The time-restricted feeding group lost 4.3% and 2.9% of cross-sectional muscle area in the arms and the legs, respectively, while the muscle cross-sectional area actually increased in the arms and the legs in the normal diet group. So there was an increase of 11% in the arms and in the legs, there was 6.9%, almost a 7% increase uh, in the normal diet group. So if you look at the total shift, because remember, time-restricted feeding group actually lost some size in the arms and the legs, whereas a normal diet group gained some size, the swing was about 15% of the muscle size was lost in the arms. That was a difference at the end of 12 months and about 9% in the legs. So let me just ask you the question, is that significant for you? And are you willing to trade slightly smaller arm muscles for all of the beneficial improvements that we're going to talk about here from a cardiometabolic health standpoint? Uh, massive reduction in leptin, massive improvement in adiponectin, decrease in glucose, decrease in insulin, increase in uh, tr uh, HDL and reduction in triglycerides, and very significant shifts in inflammatory biomarkers. So that's the thing. How, with all due respect, how vain are you? How big of arms do you need to feel good in your life? And are you willing to compromise you know, other areas of, of your health to have those arms? So that's a question that, that is individual. I can't make that for you. I can't tell you what to do, but you need to figure that out for yourself. So for me, I'll take you know, 12 to 15% smaller arms for better improvements in leptin signaling, for better, you know, greater reduction in insulin. And what was also unique here is there was a difference in testosterone. So testosterone did decrease in the time-shifted feeding group by about 17%. It was 16.8%. But what the authors talk about in the study was that that shift in testosterone could have been to the reduction in leptin. We know that leptin is a fuel sensor. And if you're already lean and leptin goes down, that could, be, could mean to the brain, to the body, hey, maybe it's not a good time to procreate. Maybe there's not enough fuel around uh, you know, to, to signal high testosterone. So just keep that in mind. Testosterone and body fat reflection does Im does impact hormone levels. So keep that in mind. Now, here's where it gets interesting from a metabolic health specifically standpoint. So there was a decrease in leptin over the course of the 20, uh, sorry, uh, 12 month study by 24.9%. And there was an improvement in adiponectin by 21%. So why is that significant? Why is the swing 25% decrease in leptin, 21% improvement in adiponectin? Well, Adiponectin is intimately involved in insulin signaling and insulin sensitivity. Another way to potentially improve adiponectin outside of exercise and, and compressing your feeding window could be taking omega-3 fats. There's some research showing fish oil compared to non-fish oil users. There's several studies over the years that have shown that that might improve adiponectin, but it, it is involved in this AMPK signaling. It's involved in metabolism. They're all associated with improvements in metabolic health. So Generally speaking, you want a lower level of leptin, higher level of adiponectin. So important stuff. Now, let's get into glucose and insulin signaling. This is where things get really interesting, as well as triglycerides and LDL and HDL. So at the end of the study, HDL increased by 15.39%. Glucose, insulin, and triglycerides dropped, respectively, by 9%, 28%, and 20%. So again, glucose dropped by 9%, insulin dropped by 28%. That's pretty significant uh, if you think about that. So if you're fasting insulin with say 10 or 12, you're cutting that down into seven, eight, nine, you know, in that ballpark, which, you know, that's a big swing uh, in insulin. So that's, and again, these people weren't doing any prolonged fasting or things like that. That's important. Uh, of course, when you see changes in insulin, you're expected to see changes in triglycerides. And so this 20% reduction in triglycerides by just fasting an additional four hours a day, that's achievable for a lot of people. That is. Uh, and again, what's important is in the TRF group compared to the normal diet group, there was no changes in pre and post levels of insulin, glucose, you know, um, adiponectin, leptin, insulin, triglycerides, all that. So these are changes that were only seen in the time restricted feeding group comparing baseline to after 12 months. Even more, markers of chronic inflammation were significantly reduced in the TRF group versus the normal feeding group. So uh, some of these names may not mean a whole lot to you because, you know, chronic inflammation, you're like, well, what is interleukin-6 interleukin or interleukin-1-beta or TNF-alpha? Well, just understand that these are byproducts of innate immune system activation. These innate immune system activation is linked with chronic inflammation. 
So you hear more about C-reactive protein, and I'm not sure why that wasn't measured in the study because, you know, looking at these cytokines, it gets expensive. Most people don't have access to this and, and all that. And it's important that when you're measuring cytokines, you're measuring them, you know, you're comparing apples to apples. If you do your labs at six in the morning, you have to redo them, you know, at six in the morning. If you measure cytokines at different times of the day, they could be a little bit off. But IL-1 beta, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, all markers of chronic inflammation, all factors that increase and predispose your body to autoimmunity, poor outcomes with COVID, uh, insulin resistance even. These were decreased by 22.9% for interleukin-1 beta. For interleukin-6, it, it dropped by 25%, pretty significant. And if you think about TNF-alpha, that dropped by 13.8%. So really important stuff. Now, again, the, the downside of time-restricted feeding and fasting for an additional four hours is slightly smaller arms if you're into having muscular-looking arms. That was about a 15% difference in the muscle cross-sectional area. Now, keep that in mind. Strength was the same, but you get all these other improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors, improvements in the HOMA IR score, and reductions in chronic inflammation. So that's the trade-off for you. If you know, Do what's best for you and figure out the feeding window that works with your lifestyle with your work patterns, with you know your kids uh, feeding and everything like that. What I think would be interesting is actually comparing, you know, a an early time restricted feeding to the normal diet. The normal diet was again eight to eight, but if you were to look at say eight to four, what would that look like? So compare the normal diet and the same same window compression, sixteen hour fast, but having food earlier in the day. What would that have done? Interesting stuff, friends. I think it's pretty fascinating. What do you think about this study and do these study outcomes, you know, mean anything to you? And I would say the shortcomings and the limitations of the study is number one, it was a relatively small subset. There was 10 subjects in each arm, right? So pretty small study. Again, it's the longer the studies get, the harder it is to have people adhere to this because they're getting calls from a dietitian every week. They're doing this, they're doing that. Like that's going to be a little bit challenging logistically. The other logistical challenge here is this was all men. So keep that in mind. There are some shortcomings here. It would be more interesting to look at the study and look at, okay, what does the mixed gender study look like? What does the study look like? Looking at early time restricted feeding versus a normal feeding window, all of those things would be important. And I'm sure this group of really curious investigators will maybe conduct a similar experiment or redo this experiment uh, over the years ahead. So as always, friends, I would love to know what you think. Let me know in the comment below, comment section below or on our website. Let me know uh, what you think about this. And if this changes how you view your own feeding window, I know for me, I'm going to strive more for compressing that feeding window because I find that if I deviate a little bit, my fasting insulin starts to creep up. Uh, it could be a genetic thing, could be epigenetic. There is diabetes type 2, particularly in my family. Uh, and I would like to keep that at bay because I would like to prevent cancer. I would like to prevent mild cognitive impairment and dementia and all those things. So I would like to know what you think. Let me know in the comment section below or over on YouTube, and we will catch you on a future episode down the road. If you don't listen to our show tomorrow, I wish you an awesome Thanksgiving. Um, it's a great time of year. I love the holidays. I'm sure you do as well. So enjoy that time with your friends and family, and we will catch you on a future one. Bye now. Yeah.